Okay, the recording is on. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to um, BC213, our course on the end times. Um, and, um, we're going to get into our lectures. Let's just take a moment to pray, and then we'll get started. I request one of us just to please pray, and I'm sure the others will join the class soon. Precious Lord, we want to thank you for this morning. Lord, we humble ourselves before your presence. We pray, O oh God, that you would speak to us today. Help us to know more about your coming. We pray, O oh God, that we would understand it well. Open the eyes of our understanding, O oh God, that we may see the wonders of your word, O oh God. Anoint your uh, man to reveal your word to us, O oh God. We thank you for this time. Help all of the other classmates also to join soon, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Um, Safina, Paul, Silatoli, Anita. Thank you for connecting and joining this morning. So uh, we've uh, started this exciting study on the end times. Uh, it's really uh, wonderful uh, to look into the scriptures and see what the Bible has to say about things to come, about the last things or things that are still, you know, they're, they're from our time on into the future. So last week we gave us, uh, gave an introduction on how we are going to approach this course. I'll just quickly run through some of the key points. And today we will begin uh, with chapter one, where we talk about the fact that the Bible is a prophetic book. And we look at, we will look at one of the main passages or uh, in the gospels, of course they're parallel, uh, Matthew 24 and also uh, we have a little of in Mark and Luke. Uh, there are parallel passages, but mainly Matthew, we look at one of the passages where the Lord Jesus himself is giving us kind of an overview of the end times. So we will uh, go through that today. It gives us a, a, an overview, and we will also uh, uh, look at the sections or the timelines that um, the Lord, or what was outlined for us there in Matthew 24. So that's our plan. Let's quickly uh, review last week's uh, course just to touch on the key highlights and then we will uh, move forward. So we had the uh, course outline, I mean, the course uh, notes and Charlotte, if you have downloaded that. And we went through the introduction last week. So, you know, we looked at reasons why we should study about the end times. And we mentioned at least six reasons that are important for us as believers to be studying the end times, how it affects our life, how it affects our hope for the future, how it also affects our being in readiness for the coming of the Lord, and it, how it also affects our preaching and teaching, that really uh, uh, the preaching and the teaching should include the message about the end times and the, the prophetic scriptures. And that is part of what will bring people to faith in Christ. So we covered that. Then we looked at how we are going to study, you know, how we're taking approach in studying uh, the end times. So we mentioned, you know, we to take, when we read the prophetic scriptures, we know there's a lot of uh, imagery, a lot of figures, things that are given in pictures. So our approach is let's try to interpret them literally. And then if the literal, of course, is not uh, uh, practical, then we look at it from a figurative sense. So first the literal, then the figurative. Very simple. Uh, we don't engage in sensationalism. We don't try to predict things. No, we just stay with the scriptures. We also understand that there are different positions, you know, within the Christian church. There are people who have different points of view. Uh, we recognize that. And we, uh, you know, we 
understand what they are saying. And at the same time, we also want to understand our position. So which, uh, you know, I, I, we will explain as we journey through the scriptures and say, okay, this is our position. This is why we are saying what we're saying. We will, of course, give reasons. And at the same time, we are, we are aware that there are people who may have a different point of view. And we are not going to fight or, you know, get into arguments. Uh, that's okay. Right? We understand what their point of view is. So we explained some of the common positions that people have in 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 uh, concerning the end times and where Christ will come and so on we explained that then uh some other things about how we interpret scripture we try to look at it look at those things from a complete perspective don't take one passage in isolation you know uh, put everything together on that same subject so then that will give us a complete view um if you take only one passage in isolation, then it's quite possible to, you know, come up with some different explanation. But it is always good to go from Genesis to Revelation on that subject because you will find that sometimes, you know, there are things that have been said about that particular event in many other books in the Bible. And so we need to bring all of that together. And then we connect Old Testament and New Testament together. And we also use Bible biblical typology, if you're going to interpret figures, stay within the scriptures as far as possible. Uh, in fact, you know, almost everything is explained within the scriptures. Sometimes it's explained the same chapter, sometimes it's explained in other places. So when we want to interpret the figures, what does this figure mean? Okay, look at it within the Bible. Um, we also mentioned about uh, recognizing time frames where within one passage, of scripture, sometimes even within one verse of scripture, there could be different time frames being addressed, and we must be aware of that. We gave uh, one or two examples. Um, we talked about the fact that sometimes scriptures can have a dual fulfillment, meaning there is an immediate fulfillment and there is also a future fulfillment. So, uh, 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 so. Also, one more thing I need to add is there is a dual fulfillment both in terms of church and Israel. Example is, uh, of course, uh, example, Joel said, Joel chapter 2, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So Joel is prophesying. Whom was he speaking to? He was speaking to Israel. Now, there is a fulfillment of that promise with the church. We all know that. Acts chapter 2. Um, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is poured out on the first the early church or the first believers. And uh, Peter said, this is a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. So we know it's there, fulfilled in the church. But it will also be fulfilled with regards to Israel. Uh, Zechariah 12.10, Zechariah prophesied, says, you know, that the spirit of grace and supplication will be poured out on the house of Israel. So we are finding that Joel's prophecy has a dual fulfillment, both in terms of church and Israel. So in scripture, understand this idea or this truth about dual fulfillment. It has to do with time, meaning some, some is in fulfilled immediately and also in the future. Some is fulfilled the church, and then with Israel. And so we can see examples of this. Um, number nine, we are open to some unexpected ways for fulfillment, meaning some things are, you know, we're just watching, we're seeing how these prophecies are going to unfold. So we are not locked into one particular way for it to be fulfilled. And one example that I gave was um, about the mark of the beast. Now we know it is there. Clearly, it, it, Revelation 13, it says, uh, uh, this is the mark which the Antichrist will use, 666. Uh, it will be on the hands and in the forehead. Okay. And you cannot transact financially unless you have that mark. That means you have said yes to the Antichrist. So we understand that. But how it is going to be literally fulfilled, 
we will leave it open. Uh, you know, there are so many ways mm, that uh, a mark can be given, you know, uh, so we don't want to lock in to something. You know, okay, maybe he will use a microchip, maybe there will be some other way of branding people on the hand and in the forehead or some way uh, we don't want to, you know, uh, get locked into one particular, leave it open. But we know this will be fulfilled, you know, as the scripture has said. So some things, uh, how exactly it's going to happen, keep it open. We don't know because, you know, God, God spoke through the prophet way into the future. And uh, how it literally will happen, uh, we, it's not so important. And uh, we also are aware, uh, last point, is that, um, you know, we are 100% sure of how certain, when and how certain things will be fulfilled, right? We know it is in scripture exactly how. We, we, we don't know. So the timing, leave it to God. Times especially, uh, God has revealed certain things, but many of the things, especially concerning timing, we don't know. So we just leave it to God and we will look for the signs of the times. We we'll look for things, how, how close they are going to happen. Example, in uh, both in the book of Daniel, and we, you know, we will see this, Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, and also in Revelation 11, it is clear that the temple in Jerusalem will be there. And there will be sacrifices going on the Jewish sacrifices. And the Antichrist, and Paul also writes about this, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. So we have it in multiple places, you know, Daniel 9, Jesus spoke about it in Matthew 24, Paul wrote about it in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, John the, the Apostle wrote about it in Revelation chapter 11 that the, the the temple will be desecrated the temple the jewish temple right will be desecrated so it's clear so like we said there are you know four different references at least to talk about this right now when we look at the temple mount in jerusalem it is occupied by the arabs the muslims they have the the whole temple mount area basically uh, uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock is sitting on the Temple Mount. That was the place where Solomon's Temple was there. That was the place where uh, the Temple was rebuilt after they came back now from the Babylonian captivity. But then that was taken over by the Muslims now. So it is clear from the scriptures, that somehow there has to be this third temple where worship is going on and where it will then be desecrated. The Antichrist will come and set himself as God. So the big question is, okay, according to the scriptures, there has to be this temple. The Antichrist has to come in and set himself up as God and speak blasphemies against God. It is very clearly stated in the scriptures. Uh, right now, that Temple Mount is being occupied by the Muslims. So when will this happen? Oh, we don't know. We don't know. Will it happen? Well, if these scriptures have to be fulfilled, somehow uh, a Jewish temple has to come there in that place. And... Uh, um, there has to be the restoration of worship in that place because it is stated clearly in scripture. Timing, oh, we don't know. But we know that by the time Revelation 11 comes, that means by the time we're in the middle of the seven years of tribulation, the three and a half years, it has to be there, right? Yeah, and and it, it will be there. So that much we know, the three and a half years we know, it's given in scripture. 
but exactly which, how and all this is going to happen, we don't know. We will watch and see how all this is going to unfold. Just give, giving you an example, all right? So some of the things we don't, uh, there are certain things that we won't subscribe to very clearly. and We can say that these things we don't believe, okay? So let's get started with our chapter one, the Bible, a prophetic book. Maybe I will just see if any questions from last class, any questions um, from the introduction so far? Any questions, any, uh, any thoughts? Okay, so we will now start getting into our uh, course content and uh, feel free to ask any questions, uh, anything is not clear, or you want me to repeat something, uh, please feel free to ask. Let's go to chapter one. So here, we just want to uh, introduce the fact that Bible prophecy can be completely trusted. We can, you know, it's all, uh, like, some preachers, I don't know exactly who said it first, but you know, you would have heard this uh, uh, statement. You know, people say, Bible prophecy is history written in advance. So, Bible prophecy is human history written in advance. So, that's how reliable the prophetic scriptures are. We know that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God uh, and we know and I'm just quickly going through these scriptures because we are familiar with it we know that prophecy uh, was it, it didn't come by some man or some person sitting and writing some ideas that you know that they were just making up no we understand that the spirit of Christ was in them and he was testifying about things beforehand. So it was the Holy Spirit in these prophets, in these people, who was, who was speaking to them and showing them beforehand things to come uh, about Jesus, about his sufferings, uh, and everything else, the thing that would, would, be, would happen out in the future. And these prophets, they, it was revealed to them, but they re realized it's not just for them. It is not the prophecies, the things that they were speaking about. It was not just for themselves, but they were speaking ahead way into time for people in the future who were going to receive the gospel and the Holy Spirit, right? the gospel and so these prophecies the, these prophets were inspired by the holy spirit they spoke beforehand things about jesus about his suffering about everything that's going to come after that they spoke beforehand and they understood they were not speaking this for themselves that means these things were not going to happen in their own lifetime no 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 they were speaking way into the future for those whom the gospel was going to be preached and to whom the Holy Spirit was going to be given, meaning us people and those, you know, in our gen those who've, who've come on since then. And so we understand that the prophet spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And also, very interesting, it says, the angels desire to look into this, these things. Can you imagine? Even the angels, <laughs> even the angels are trying to understand these things. So you can imagine, you know, we are reading the Bible about all these things. So in some way, even the angels are looking into these matters which the prophets spoke or the Holy Spirit through the prophet spoke. Angels are looking at, okay, when is this going to happen? When is this going to unfold? Angels are desiring to understand these things. You know, uh, Second Peter, same thing. Peter repeats, he says, uh, the prophecy of scripture 
it didn't come by any private interpretation. You know, it wasn't like somebody made it up. No, the holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Right. So that is something we must not forget. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So this is so uh, important for us that the scriptures or the prophecy of scripture is 100% reliable because it was God, God the Holy Spirit, speaking through the prophets. So that cannot go wrong. It's not a hit and miss kind of thing. It's not, you know, a guess work. The Holy Spirit spoke through these prophets. And so these prophets, the scriptures, these prophetic scriptures are 100% reliable. So we can look at some examples. And I think, you know, these, these are things you are familiar with. Um, uh, and, and you know some people those who have really counted all these things prophecies uh, tell us you know there are approximately 2500 prophecies about 2000 of them have already been fulfilled without any error this is from Euros um, and uh, the Bible contains 10,385 verses uh, that speak about the return of the Lord so there are many you know like you can count and if you want to put it in terms of numbers this is what we could say and some examples here and uh, I've just quoted, quoted these examples from the writings of uh, Dr. Hiros here for example the Egyptian slavery you know God spoke to Abraham 400 years he said your people will be slaves for 400 years and then I will bring them out and just as God said God's people were in slavery in Egypt 400 years and then shortly after that, they made the journey into the land of Canaan, the land of promise. Babylonian captivity. And, you know, the, the prophets were warning. Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they were all speaking, saying, hey, you're going, you know, God is going to bring judgment. You're going to be in captivity for 70 years. You're going to be taken away from your land you're going to go to a foreign land you're going to be in captivity for 70 years and after that you'll come back right and so they prophesied and surely enough 70 years when 70 years was fulfilled things happened in such a way that the people were sent back to their land right so um, that's uh, again amazing. What's what's very interesting is Isaiah, as he was prophesying about this whole captivity, he prophesied 150 years before the before King Cyrus was born. He prophesied Cyrus. Cyrus. He called by name, so Isaiah 44, 28, Cyrus. So Cyrus is not a Jewish name, it's a Persian name. And he said, Cyrus, you will do what I please, and you will tell Jerusalem, Go. I mean, you will speak to Jerusalem, saying you will be built, and temple you will be restored. Now can you imagine about 150 years, more than one century ahead of time, there's a prophet, Isaiah, and he is saying, Cyrus, you are my shepherd. I mean, you are somebody I have raised up. And you're going to do what I want. You're going to tell Jerusalem to be built. You're going to tell the foundation. You're going to tell the temple the foundation will be laid. At that time, when Isaiah was speaking, Jerusalem was a fine city. Solomon's temple was there. And here Isaiah is saying, there is somebody called Cyrus, he's going to say this. 150 years before. Now, 
at that time, imagine if you were listening to Isaiah, you know, and he says again in Isaiah 45, Cyrus. Uh, if you were listening to Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, at that time he said, like, what is he talking about? You know, who is this Cyrus he's talking about? And why should Jerusalem be built? It is already built. Why should the temple foundation be laid? I mean, it's there. Why? It it didn't it wouldn't make sense. But 150 or 180 years later, everything is happening, just like he said. You know, there is um, that the people of the Jewish people are in captivity. The Babylon Empire is holding them captive. They are overthrown. The Persian Empire comes. King Cyrus, the first king, and in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in his very first year, he gives the decree. He says, people, I want you to go back and you go rebuild your temple. Right? And imagine this is coming from a Persian king, somebody who is not, you know, a not a, uh, he doesn't know the God of the Bible, but he is speaking. Uh, and he is saying this. He, and the prophecy that was spoken by Isaiah and Jeremiah, and, you know, Jeremiah said 70 years and you'll come back, so is being fulfilled. Right? So it's amazing when you look at this prophecy, um, uh, it's, it's, like, it's like we said, human history written in advance, and then as time goes, these things begin to be actually fulfilled, just as it was spoken. Um, another amazing, I think one of the most, personally for me, one of the most amazing prophecies, of course, Isaiah chapter 53 is a very amazing prophecy about the crucifixion of Christ. And Daniel chapter 9 is again a very amazing, amazing prophecy. Uh, Daniel prophesies about the coming of Jesus Christ, about Jesus' death, and and then on into eternity. Right? So, uh, not eternity, but into the millennium. He, he, he's speaking, uh, he jumps from the crucifixion on to the, uh, the millennium, the tribulation of the millennium. So, think about this. This is Daniel chapter 9, and we will look at these verses again later, but I'm just uh, mentioning it here for us to see how Bible prophecy is so amazing. It has been fulfilled, many of things. So Daniel, he spoke in Daniel chapter 9, and he said, verse 25, 26, um, Know therefore understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Okay, so again, now Daniel is speaking in figurative language, seven weeks and 62. So seven plus 62, which is 69, right? Weeks. No, we will explain weeks later, but it, you can see in Scripture, and we can show it to you from Scripture, that uh, a week represents a period of seven years. So he's, he's speaking about seven plus 62, which is 69 weeks, 69 times seven, which is 483 years. So what Daniel is saying, from the time the commandment has been given to restore and build Jerusalem, which is what we mentioned earlier, King Cyrus gave the decree to the people, go and build Jerusalem. Until Messiah comes, Jesus comes, there will be 483 years. Now can you imagine that? Daniel is prophesying. And here's Daniel, um, uh, several hundred years before the birth of Christ, he's speaking and saying, this is going to happen. Right? And then almost 500 years before. And so, sure enough, 
483 years and the Messiah comes Jesus comes so here is a time given a time foretold 69 weeks 483 years it is foretold and sure enough as it was spoken by Daniel from the time King Cyrus or the issue was decreed to the time Jesus began his ministry 483 years Jesus begins the ministry and then he continues you know there, there um, uh, he even says and after the 62 weeks Messiah will be cut off that means at the end of the 69 weeks he, he mentioned 7 plus 62 right at the end of the 62 which is really at the end of the 69 that is 7 plus 60 to 69 weeks Messiah will be cut off that means Jesus will be crucified so he foretold the coming of the Messiah and he also said the Messiah will be crucified he'll be cut off and and then it goes on right so and there's a lot more in this prophecy so this is again a very amazing prophecy because in Daniel 9 25 to 27 he covers more than 2,000 years in in those you know three verses from the time he speaks about so many things we will break it down a uh, little, little later on it's, he talks about the rebuilding of the temple he talks about the coming of the Messiah he talks about the Messiah being uh, uh, he talks about the temple being destroyed see um, and he talks about Jesus being Jesus being crucified the temple being destroyed and then he talks about the future temple being desecrated so he, he literally in those three verses Daniel 9 25 to 27 he covers or uh, 2,000 years uh, or actually more than 2,000 years he covers that whole period in just three verses very amazing very amazing right? but I just wanted to point out here that you know this timing that Daniel gave was fulfilled exactly you know he said 60 uh, seven weeks and 62 weeks that means 69 weeks there'll be 69 weeks from the time the commandment is given to go and rebuild Jerusalem till the Messiah comes 483 years and then the Messiah will be cut off he will be killed and then this will happen so it's amazing you know just beautiful we will look at this uh, later and so you know uh, uh, um, uh, professor or dr. Hugh Ross he would calculate the probability of how these of these prophecies being fulfilled and you know they're so so uh, the probability is so remote in some of these cases that for the prophecy to be fulfilled it's so so unlikely and yet they were all fulfilled then we look at you know the prophecies concerning the coming of Jesus Christ and there are so many many prophecies we've just mentioned a few here he would be the seed of a woman uh, he would come through the lineage of Abraham Isaac and Jacob he would be a descendant of Judah he would be born in Bethlehem can you imagine where exactly the Messiah would be born but the name of the village is given Bethlehem um, he'd be born of a virgin he would uh, be in Egypt for some time he would grow up in Nazareth he would be betrayed by his close friend he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver and he would be crucified of course we we know that not one of his bones would be broken uh, they will cast lots for their clothing he would rise again so this is just a few yeah, of, of, the, of the prophecies concerning Jesus Christ and all of these were fulfilled okay. and so the probability of one man one person in history fulfilling all of these prophecies is just unimaginable that one human person 
would fulfill all of these prophecies. It's so unlikely, and yet, in Jesus Christ, all of these were fulfilled. And that makes it so, so amazing. Come on, uh, just a few other things here. Um, the destruction of the temple. So Jesus himself said, you know, that this temple will be destroyed. And 40 years later, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. So this, that was the temple that was rebuilt, Solomon's temple that was rebuilt. That was destroyed in AD 70 by the Roman general. Right? So that was foretold and fulfilled. And the dispersion, regathering of Israel, you know, God had spoken many times through the prophets um, that no matter where Israel was dispersed, they would be regathered. Now, there were, you know, there were time and time again when the people were brought into Jerusalem, brought into the promised land. So we know from Egypt, they were brought in there. From Babylon, they were brought back. Uh, so wherever they were dispersed, they were brought back. But then finally, when um, the Jews were overpowered, the, you know, we, we had many other kings, uh, especially the the Roman Empire when they came, they completely took over. And then later on, there were the Ottoman or the Arab, uh, which were later the Arabs came in, completely dispersed. So there was no Israel as a nation. They were Jewish people, but they were all scattered. And what is amazing is that in history, we see that finally Israel was regathered and Israel was established as a nation in 1948. So they were dispersed for thousands of years and they were finally regathered and established as a nation in 1948. It was so unlikely that that would happen and yet it was fulfilled. And God had been speaking through time over and over and over again, right from the time he gave the promise to Abraham. Abraham, this land is for your descendants. So that's 3,500 years before God spoke to Abraham. Abraham, this land I'm giving to your descendants. Okay. But these people were scattered everywhere. It, it seemed so unlikely that what God spoke to Abraham would ever be fulfilled. Because his descendants were gone, they're all scattered, and it was now, you know, later occupied by the Arabs. Uh, how could the Jews come back and take this land? It, uh, they had no control. And then suddenly, in 1948, of course, God was bringing the people back, moving in their hearts. They were, the Jews were making their journey back into that area, what we know today as Israel. And then, 1948. Israel was, de they declared themselves as a nation, and today they are strong. So, what God spoke to Abraham Abraham, your descendants, I'm giving this land from the Tigris, the Euphrates and Tigris in the north to the, uh, to the Nile in Egypt, down south. So, that full land is yet to be occupied, but a major portion. They already have control over, and it's their part of their nation. And that was fulfilled in 1948. So again, the probability that something like this would happen was so negligible, one in 10 raised to 20. But it was fulfilled, and we are living in a time where that prophecy has been fulfilled. That means what God spoke to Abraham a long time ago. Abraham, this land for your descendants, they'll be numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand in the seashore, that prophecy has been fulfilled and we are living in a time of that fulfillment. So that is very important because, as we will see, Israel is a very important part of end time Bible prophecy. A lot of things that have to do with end time Bible prophecy actually has to do with Israel. And I know we are the church, we are studying Bible prophecy, but a lot of the prophecy has to do with Israel. 
And so Israel coming to its place, its own land, having its own nation, being where it is, is very important to the fulfillment of many of the prophetic, end time prophetic scriptures. Okay, so what we did is, uh, I just quickly ran through about seven examples, uh, you know, we could have many more, of where the different things were prophesied in the Bible, you know, whether the Egyptian slavery, the Babylonian captivity, King Cyrus, uh, the coming of Christ, uh, prophecies concerning Christ, the destruction of the temple, or the get regathering of Israel. These are just some examples that tell us that Bible prophecy is so real. It is literally history written in advance. Okay, so any questions so far with this part? All right, so I see a question, Jeffina. What does it mean when it says uh, he would be seed of the woman? It means he was he would be born of the woman. Now, uh, you know, we think, okay, that's that's common sense, of course. Anybody <laughs> who has to be born has to be born of a woman. But I think, but the emphasis is important. That means you, his origin didn't have that of the man, Adam. Now, yes, in the natural, any person who was born was had to be born of a woman, of the woman, of of a woman, any person. But so obviously, if the Messiah was going to be a human person, he would he would have to be born of a woman. Yes, but the emphasis that which Isaiah later revealed to us, he would be born of a virgin. There would be no involvement of a man this was the work of god giving birth to this particular seed this man was born of a woman but he was born by the work of god so that's the emphasis we should highlight so to answer your question literally yeah this was going to be a descendant a human person who would crush the head of the serpent that's what genesis 315 is saying that there will come a human person who will crush the head of the serpent, the seed of the woman, being one man, would crush the head of the serpent, the devil. But the emphasis, as it unfolds, we see this man who was born had no earthly father. He was born of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Any other questions on, on this part, on the Bible being a prophetic book? Any questions on that? Everyone's following me so far? Yes, Pastor. Okay, good. Thank you. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at one of the passages um, about the end times. Okay, this is more like introduction, right? Um, which is, the, of course, um, uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, uh, as in, not the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, but his sermon as given in Matthew 24. So Jesus loved to preach on the Mount of Olives. It must have been his, you know, one of the places where he went often to preach and the crowds would come and listen. Um, we are all familiar with the Sermon on the Mount as in Matthew 5, the Beatitudes. Uh, but there's another time where Jesus comes, and this time he's speaking about the future, right? So what we want to do is we want to kind of just read that passage. I know it's a it's a long chapter, uh, but we want to read it, and then I want to I, I want to break it for us, break it down, and, and just highlight some of the key things uh, from Matthew twenty four. It'll give us a good foundation for what we're going to do. In the in the coming weeks, as we look into the end times, it's very interesting that when Jesus and I'm just giving an introduction, we'll take a break and we'll come back and read Matthew 24. It is very interesting that when Jesus, in his discourse of Matthew 24, he is actually 
looking back to the Old Testament to tell us about things to come. He points us back to the days of Noah. Very interesting. He also quotes from Daniel. Daniel as Daniel prophesied. So it shows us how the Lord Jesus is connecting things in the Old Testament and saying, hey, the Old Testament is already speaking about future events. It's pointing to certain things in the future. And especially Daniel's prophecy, which we just read, Daniel chapter 9. Um, he talks about the abomination of desolation, the man of sin who comes and desecrates the temple. So Jesus is saying, Daniel prophesied. He's validating Daniel's prophecy. Daniel said it, and that is going to happen in the future, during the tribulation. It's going to happen. So Jesus is validating Daniel's prophecy. Right? So, And of course, he tells us a lot of things, other things that to look out for uh, as signs to the end times. So we will take some time just to read that whole chapter, Matthew 24, and then uh, you know, look at what the Lord gave to us, okay, uh, as far as the end times. So let's take a break. Now we will go for a 10 minutes break and we will come back and dive into Matthew chapter 24. Thank you, everyone. See you in 10 minutes, okay?